and welcome again to my show, Searching for Integrity. My name really is John Smith. I'm searching for people with integrity. Because our country suffers from IDD, Integrity Deficit Disorder. Today we have uh, Mr. Bob Delaney, author of Heroes Are Human. Bob, are you there? Thank you. Pleasure to be with you, John. I'm glad you're here. Uh, you're, you've, you seem to be a very storied person. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> well, you've had quite a career and a number of careers, so that, uh, that's what I'm picking up on. Um, yes, sir. Yes, it is. Uh, I uh, usually, uh, when I go through a book or go through a person, uh, I always try to hit the table of contents. And I started this morning quite early and discovered that every chapter is a different person. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then I thought, you know, this can be good. This can be good. This can be good. So in, in looking at it, uh, we can say you're, we're probably at least, um, gosh, 10 people that are, that are friends of yours. They're on the, on the table of contents. Yeah, 10 people that I got the opportunity to spend time with that are really representative of all our healthcare community. Really, really. Um, it's uh, quite, a, quite an effort that you've made here and, and quite a, uh, uh, I would say, uh, um, way that people are going to take it and they're going to take it very well. Thank um, you. Yeah, I'm going to start off with something that doesn't apply anymore other than me watching it on TV when I was growing up. Um, you have been a prowess, uh, previously an NBA referee, referee for a quarter of a century. Yeah, that's that was uh, one of my jobs. I, I, I started out uh, after I grad came out of college and, and went in the New Jersey State Police. And uh, as a result, I worked a long-term undercover job for three years of my life. I became another person, infiltrated the mob, uh, Genovese and Bruno crime families. As a result, uh, dealt with post-traumatic stress myself, and basketball was my therapy. It was, gave me an uh, inner peace. I played ball at the high school and college level, so getting back on a basketball court was a peaceful place for me. And uh, it opened one door to another. I couldn't play anymore, so I started officiating. And he came calling after a period of time and offered a position within the National Basketball Association where I uh, referee for 25 years. Well, that's terrific. Uh, very, very, um, very fast and probably kept you in shape for a long time. Yeah, it does. You, you run, run quite a bit. You better be in physical shape to stay with those guys. <laughs> and that's probably good motivation to say, I'm going to quit this and do something else. <laughs> um, let's see the uh, the heroes are human. The heroes, the lessons in res resilience, courage, and wisdom um, from the COVID front lines. Um, that's pretty scary if you don't know much about it. I, yeah, uh, it, it's it's a title that I came up with. Um, it's it's not about COVID. It's about the front lines of being involved with um, the difficult things that those who serve uh, go through. So I've been doing work with the military, law enforcement, firefighters for the past four decades in the area of post traumatic stress. I've written two other books before this. One was about my experience from that undercover uh, assignment called "Over My Years Infiltrating Mob." The other book is called "Surviving the Shadows: A Journey of Hope." into post-traumatic stress. Uh, mm -hmm. John, I called it Surviving the Shadows because I believe we all have shadows in life at times. And I always tell people never be afraid of a shadow because in order for a shadow to exist, there has to be light nearby. And it is our responsibility to ourselves and to each other to get to that light. And so with that work, I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan numerous times at every military base around the United States, Asia, and Europe, spending time with our troops, still do that. But when COVID came about, I was driving by hospitals and I kept seeing signs that heroes work here. 
And uh, I know that anyone that is ever given that term hero really doesn't like it. And so it drove me to become more knowledgeable about what the healthcare community was going through, because in my eyes, they were going through an invisible, they were at war with an invisible enemy. Yes, I can tell that. Uh, also, uh, as you're going through the countries you've been with the military, I only got to do Vietnam, but that was, that was all I wanted to do. Well, thank you for your service. I said, no, thank you anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and you're a guy that would know this. When people say that to me, thank you for your service, I usually say, well, you know, really, just tell me welcome home. Mm -hmm. Because very, we had a lot. Of, yeah. But if you, talk, if you talk a, a millennium in that, they, they don't have a clue what it's about. Right, right, right. Anyway, this was probably uh, when I see these these authors that were, were contributing to the book. Uh, it seemed to me that you would have um, you know, uh, uh, your your rope is is in a corral, and you've got to keep all these people, <laughs> uh, you know, pitching and writing and so forth, and editing. That's uh, that's quite an effort. Uh, is that is that something that you enjoyed? I do. Um, so my my story when I did the first book, it was telling my story, so it was in first person, it was easier. And then I did a similar thing in Survive in the Shadows where I had others tell me their stories, I wanted to be a little more specific in this to hear exactly from those who are, are, are going through these uh, experiences. And I think it's important to be in their, for, for be in their words, right? Because at times we all could kind of interpret someone else's words and put it into ours. And I wanted, so I spoke on the front end and the back end of the chapters after they spoke. Uh, but hearing their, their stories are extremely important for me. Same thing with Vietnam vets, same thing with vets from Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I think storytelling is a big, important part of who we are. It's part of our experiential learning. And we also come from a history of town criers where we heard stories being told uh, in, our, in our nation and sure. uh, learn from storytelling. So you're doing the same thing, John. You're storytelling by bringing storytellers to, to your folks. Well, that's that's a good way to put it. I really enjoy it, and I order the pe. I, I, I'm lucky to meet people like you. Uh, that's well, got thank you. such such a history, and, and what this is what turns on my listeners, and that's what mm -hmm. is going to get the bu the books tales. Uh, right. And and I oh one thing I wanted to, to say, uh, your wife is Billy. Yes. And she's a marathoner. Yes. Um, and I saw the number of years that you had been there at the waiting, at, at the finish line for her, was one of was either one of those, the time when the explosion occurred. Were you there? No, no. She she ran Boston Marathon often, but not the year that the uh, Boston uh, Marathon um, bombers were involved. Uh, and it's interesting you bring it up because Dick Donahue is a good friend of mine. He was the police officer who, if you if you all remember. Um, he actually let out and died twice that day. And I'm happy to say, and, and he's a good friend and we've spent a lot of time together and he's alive and well today and doing well, but he, he was on the front lines there. And those are folks that I spend a lot of time with. And so, um, yeah, and that, that was, uh, I know what you're, you're making reference to in the book because I used that experience. I would go to Billy's marathons and I always thought they were amazing uh, displays of the human spirit because people were running for causes and, and, and sure. different things. Also, uh, they have a beginning, middle, and an end, and they train for it. And so I use the analogy in the book that while starting off for a marathon, even though it's 26.2 miles, it's a long, and you have to pace yourself. But I use that analogy of saying, can you imagine when our healthcare workers, the doctors and nurses on the front lines of COVID, when they started that race, they didn't know how long it was going to go. They didn't know how to pace themselves. It was just start. Right. And, Take off. And so I can, can't imagine how frustrating and how difficult that must have been. Well, I have some experience with that. And, and it is, um, I was a tri triathlon. Mm -hmm. I used to do that. Uh, actually, I've, one, of, one of my son's twins, um, he, uh, he's an uh, Ironman two times. Um, That's awesome. 
It is awesome. <laughs> they were trying to get me into it, but I, I had to cop, stop the other ones because I had a bad knee. I had a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. And you don't run very far on that knee if you want to, if, if, you, if you keep it, if you want to keep it. Right, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, the best of the human spirit, I like that. It's really something. And I see that you're a champion of that. Um, For sure, yeah. Yeah. Any, any particular uh, of, of, the, of the writers or the authors, the many authors, did you? Um, yeah, um, so those that I interviewed, I wanted to be representative of not only the entire healthcare community and how they it was impacted, because I, I understand this from the military and law enforcement side of being involved in uh, traumatic events, right? I often say that uh, those who serve see what the rest of the world does not. And um, when, when, if you take the military, law enforcement, firefighters, they go to where trauma is. They respond to with the healthcare community, trauma comes in the front door of either the hospital or the emergency care uh, unit they're working in. And similar, uh, at times, you being a veteran understand this, at times the uniforms we wear, whether it was the state police uniform I used to wear or the military uniform you wore, at times we like to think of ourselves as being able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. We can handle anything. <laughs> and uh, I think that's true of lab coats and scrubs as well for those who are in the healthcare. That they have to compartmentalize their emotion to do their job the same way the cops and firefighters and military do. And yet we have to always remember that while they're doing heroic things, ordinary people doing extraordinary things, there's also a human being inside of those uniforms. And we have to tend to that and, and, and make sure that they're in a safe environment. I agree. I agree. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess we both wore the same kind of hat when I got home. From from Nam, uh, I took an opportunity to get closer to my uh, then fiance uh, at Fort Polk or any any choice any any fort, and I took it. And the, the deal mm -hmm. was, you got to become a drill sergeant. Right, right. And I did. Actually, I was the honor graduate of my drill sergeant school, so that was that was good. Um, yes, yes. Did you wear that kind of hat? Uh, I was an instructor at the academy to my last few years in the state police before I left to go into the MBA. Um, and uh, so after the undercover job, I went into detective work and organized crime and intelligence. And then from there, I went to the academy where I ran a uh, Institute on Organized Criminal Groups program for the New Jersey State Police. Right. Right. That's a, that's a lot of knowledge you got there uh, and a lot of experience and a lot of probably a lot of uh, um uh, 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 thankful that you're doing it, and I guess is a good way to put it. Yeah, um, you know, those experiences, uh, especially the undercover work, well, I, it was a, something that I had to do to put a lot of bad people away. That experience and what I went through helps me to help a lot of good people today. So yes. at times you have to go, you know, there's, there's, there's no testimony without a test. And so I had to be tested <laughs> that undercover work, the same way you were in, in Vietnam. I mean, these are tests that come to us in our lives. And, 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 it, and it's a way for resiliency to become even a strong, we become stronger uh, as a reason for some of these things. Yes, very much so, very much so. Um, personalities, are, were all these people, uh, were they interlinked somehow, some way, or were they all... Um, writing it at home and not sharing it with anybody. How yeah, I think there was a, yeah, that's a great question. I think there was a tendency on most of their parts to compartmentalize and push down the feeling of wanting to express what they were going through. Uh, John, I use this analogy in presentations. I ask people to imagine I'm holding a big balloon over my head full of air. How do I get the air out? I can take a pin and pop it. We get the air out, but we don't have a balloon anymore. I can let it go. It flies all over the room. It goes out the room. We don't know what happened to the balloon, but if we're patient, and willing to listen to sounds we do not want to hear. And it may hurt our ears. We turn it upside down, little air at a time. Er, makes that screeching noise. Eventually, yeah. all the air out of the balloon, we have a full balloon to use again one day. That's us with traumas, emotions. We need to get the air out, but more often than not, we as human beings push them down one on top of another on top of another. And if you take that analogy to its fruition, eventually that balloon is going to burst if we do that. So my hope is to be able to have people put roadblocks up for post-traumatic stress and speak about it, 
but not just to anyone. Talk to someone who has gone through a similar experience, someone who has uh, it, that you, you have a trusted relationship. And so that one on one, we're three folks together talking about what is personal is universal. Uh, you know, it, it allows them to get the air out of the balloon and, and process some of the trauma that they've experienced. Right. Right. The, uh, the, the, the book is a must listen for healthcare workers and have the seize the young ongoing pandemic. Where, where are we now in another pond pandemic? Uh, are you yeah, you know what that? happened? Yeah, John, what happened was um, in 2020 in the Tampa uh, uh, Times, I wrote an article um, predicting post-traumatic stress wave within the healthcare community because of the trauma that they were about to undergo and experience. Um, they were experiencing things that they would normally not. You know, they're not the ones holding hands of people dying or setting up FaceTime calls or Zooms to say goodbye. Usually family members are in the hospital when that's taking place. So they were thrust into new roles. As well, I spoke to maternity nurses who were now working in uh, COVID wards. So it was a whole different transition of having to do healthcare work. These were ad additional stressors on top of them. And then the largest one being that they never had to be afraid of bringing cancer home. They never had to be afraid of bringing any other kind of disease home. Now they had to be afraid of infecting their own loved ones. So it changed their patterns. Some slept in garages. Some uh, took their clothes off before they came in and stayed in different parts of the houses because they were afraid. And we all remember in the early stages of COVID, we really didn't know what was going on, right? Well, either did the health community. I mean, they were learning, they were going. And those, that's the fog of war. It, it, it's, that's where all wars are different, but all wars are the same. And the fog of war was taking place. And the stressors of being at battle with this invisible uh, enemy called COVID was taking a toll. Do you have your ear to the ground on what I'm hearing on the TV that somewhere it's, it's starting up again? Is, is that true? Yeah, I think there's pockets of it, but I think we're in a, from what the healthcare community is telling me is that we're in a better place, but there's still many people dying on a daily basis as a result of COVID, um, but, but not at anywhere near where we were years ago. Right. But so what we're finding is the burnout rate within the healthcare community is very high. And we, as, as those that they serve, we're the patients, going to be potential patients at some point. This is where the concern should be because we're losing a lot of experience in the healthcare community because people are walking away. They're burnt out. They're tired of doing this profession. Right. My belief is just like we, you know, your generation, my generation of the Vietnam vets were vilified. They, they were not honored in the way they should have been. And um, today we know as a country that we honor and thank and support our troops. We need to do the same thing with our healthcare community. We need to honor, thank, and support those who serve us. Right. Is, is there a rotation that uh, is, is good for people to do that? Um, as what they're doing, you know, and you can't do it all the time, but, right. but, but you need to ro you know, rotate yourself or ro the, the, same thing with, with you, you go to Nam for a year, then you come back. And if you want to go again, you can do it, but they give you a little space. Yeah, it's a great point. And, and uh, conversations that are had with leadership, we're um, understanding that they can learn a great deal from the military. The military has been very progressive with post-traumatic stress for the last 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, do tremendous programs. In fact, um, later this evening, I'll be meeting with uh, uh General Fenton, who is the uh, commander of the Special Forces at McDill uh, Air Force Base, and um, ongoing conversations. How can we improve and how can we do better to provide our troops with resiliency levels, self-care, understanding that self-care does not mean selfish. It's okay to take care of yourself, um, but also for their families. Because when someone is going through difficult times, their family and loved ones are getting hit with emotional shrapnel. And so this is not just about an individual. It's a holistic approach to take care of those. So we're bringing those same kind of programs to the healthcare community. Right. 
Well, that's important, and it's a good uh, good thing to do. Uh, every little bit, every little bit helps, you know. Yes, sir. Every little okay. bit helps. Um, now, don't call me sir. I, I was a drill sergeant. Remember? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist. <laughs> um, in the uh, in the the uh, usually what I do when I interviewing someone like you and I'm going through the, the table of contents and why'd you write this and why'd you do that? Mm -hmm. And when I looked at it this morning, I thought they're all different. Mm -hmm. And uh, which, but it also gave me 12 different ways to, to, uh, to deal with it. Um, and I'm just curious that some of these were, um, I guess some are better than others. Are they, you, you can really, they're literate uh, authors, um, but then everybody here are doctors, or uh, mostly, and, and all of that. They're well well educated. educated. Um, did you find the same thing from among everybody? Is that how you were? I did, John. Yeah, one of the things that we did. We, uh, Dave Shire is my co-author. We we interviewed folks and we took their words. We put it into the chronicle on a rock. <laughs> the order that it should be said. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, we, we put it in the order that it should be said. And then uh, we gave it back to them to approve so that it was their words that were being spoken. And, you know, go back to what I said earlier. Right? It's, it's, it's great that you noted that there's 12 different, but kind of like the same, but each personality is shown through. And each area where they worked uh, was being identified. So, who is frontline nurses, ICU nurses, um, uh, doctors on the front line, but also doctors who were in leadership positions in the management. And I refer to that as behind the front lines chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There's still decisions being made. And when decisions are being made that impact other people's lives, that's a heavy, heavy lies the crown, right? I mean, right. there's a lot of pressure with that kind of decision making. And um, I also wanted to show how selfless some of these folks were. Leah Churchill was a nurse at Moffitt Cancer Hospital in Tampa. When she heard the call that came out from New York City when the, that became the epicenter of uh, COVID, right. she volunteered to serve there. And she told her story about how she went to her bosses and said, I'm going to leave. Uh, can you hold my job? And they did. And she went up to New York at her own expense and paid for her own hotel room and then volunteered in a hospital working 12 hours a day for almost three weeks to be able wow. to support her fellow nurses. Wow. That's amazing. Um, you know, with, with people like that, you know, pat them on the back and, and you know, pretty soon they'll be, have a sore back. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> the, these are, um, Amazing people doing the work of angels and, um, you know, they're givers in the game of life. Um, they right. take care of everyone else. And this is where I'm trying to move the bar for them to understand to take care of themselves as well. Right. How long did it take you to, uh, to, to start the book, finish the book? I came up with the idea, as I said, as I was driving by hospitals and saw those signs, heroes work here, and then mm -hmm. started working it out. And it probably took us about eight months. To, to complete the interviews, uh, get the writing in place, and then get it to the publisher, who then took another two months before it was published. So it's, a, it's a probably about an, a one-year project. Right. Well, that's uh, that's a good, well, one-year well to do. I, I managed myself uh, as best that I could. I, I'm, I'm an author. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I try, and I still have thoughts about it and more. I still feel there's something else in me. Are you right. thinking about an, another book uh, that you might? Yeah, as I said, I have three. I write a lot of articles um, and, and, and do a lot of presentations. Uh, and so there's always this concept that's coming up. I, I, I believe in leadership, resiliency, self-care, trauma kinds of conversations. Um, and so I, I'm immersed into the post-traumatic stress kind of work. I do work with Harvard Global Mental Health Trauma Recovery. I, you know, the one thing that I think is important for folks to realize is that 
in my opinion, we have over-medicalized this conversation about post-traumatic stress. It's a human condition, not a mental illness. And um, it's been around forever. Sophocles wrote two plays about the warrior not knowing how to act after coming home from battle. After the Civil War, we called it Soldier's Heart. After World War I, shell shock, battle fatigue. After World War II, Korean Vietnam Wars, we refer to it as flashbacks. Now we call it post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think that like I said, I, I don't mean, and please don't interpret that I'm saying we don't need the medical house side of the house. We do. We have tremendous resources. We just have to find better ways to build bridges uh, for those that have the resources to provide them to for those who may need the resources. And that bridge has to be built from both sides. Um, so this is the kind of message that I share. Uh, how do we normalize this conversation rather than over medicalize it and scare people away from it? Right, right. There's a certain sentence here in one of your paragraphs, not all wounds bleed and invisible wounds may hurt as much as the wounds we see. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. uh, Invisible wounds are are part of what takes place in our lives, right? Um, We are all susceptible susceptible to this. Dr. Richard Malika, who's the director of the Harvard Global Mental Health Trauma Recovery Program, says that trauma is inescapable in life. And what a what a great statement because we are all we all have traumas that come to us. So sure. my is that we should have uh, the same kind of education awareness programs about trauma mm-hmm. as we have about HIV AIDS that we had about uh, alcohol, drugs, tobacco. Education awareness helps people better interact with something. The more we have education about a subject, mm-hmm. the more knowledgeable we are, the better we interact. Mm-hmm whether we want them or not. Exactly. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'll stop with the sir. I just got caught again saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm past that now. <laughs> I had my fun with it. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you now to tell us where everybody can buy your book. Yeah, you can go to my website, www.delaneyconsultants.com. Uh-huh. Right? So Delaney Consultants with an S at the end, dot com. Uh, Amazon, City Point Press, uh, Simon & Schuster is the uh, distributor of this book. So any of those locations, as they say, where books can be purchased. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a good thing that, that you've done. And I'm glad to see that you've got the, the intelligence and the, 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 the way that you can, I guess, uh, herd all the cats in one particular book. Um, and that would be very special. It gives you an idea of what people know of you and, and, and admire you. Uh, well, thank you, John. Thank you for your support. And to you and your audience, stay healthy, stay safe, take care of one another, and take care of you, too. I will. And, um, you know, I want to thank my listeners for tuning in to Searching for Integrity. Uh, so long and happy trails to all. Man. <laughs>